Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the COVID-19 Our Path Forward live forum here at the Black Health Matters and Cap Alpha Psi Fraternity Health Summit. Now that COVID-19 vaccines are more widely available, many of us have been enjoying summer travel, family outings, reunions, baseball games, and summer camps. And although vaccines are more widely available against COVID-19, African-Americans fall significantly behind the rest of the population in getting vaccinated. That means that many of the people who we are come in contact with on a daily basis, like our family, friends, and even the cashier at the grocery store have not been vaccinated and are at risk of acquiring and spreading the disease. With new variants like Delta emerging every day, it's so important to know how can we can continue to enjoy the summer safely. It's time to reclaim our health and get back to our healthy routines that we've overlooked. As we begin to make plans to return to work and school in the fall, we must continue to protect ourselves and our loved ones. I'm Linda Erland, your moderator for today. I'm a registered nurse and a clinical quality assurance professional at GlaxoSmithKline with over 30 years of clinical research experience in the pharmaceutical industry. I am a patient advocate and committing to addressing healthcare disparities in diverse communities. In addition to my quality assurance role at GSK, I volunteer as the engagement lead for global demographics and diversity and champion efforts to increase diverse population participation in clinical studies. Before we begin today, I would like to thank our sponsor, GlaxoSmithKline, our community partners, the men of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity and the Kappa Alpha Psi Silhouettes and Black Health Matters. And thank you to you as well, our audience for joining us today. The resources discussed today, including the GSK COVID-19 brochure and handbook will be shared at the end of the discussion and at the GSK conference booth. So today, I'm so excited. We have with us today, three distinguished panelists, each experts in their field. Dr. Tamara Coyne Beasley, Dr. Omar Danner, and joining us to share his personal experiences with COVID-19 and the importance of being safe and protecting yourself as this COVID-19 crisis continues is Mr. Maurice Mo Evans. Dr. Tamara Coyne Beasley serves on the board of the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases. She is the Adolescent Medicine Chair, the Division Director for Adolescent Medicine at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and Professor of Pediatrics and Internal Medicine. As a vaccine researcher, she has served on the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Her expertise of, in training include adolescent medicine, preventative medicine, epidemiology, public health, vaccinology, and health disparities. Dr. Coyne Beasley is also a past president of the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Coyne Beasley. We also have today Dr. Danner. Dr. Omar Danner is a professor of surgery and surgical critical care in Atlanta, Georgia. He is the former chief of surgery at Grady Memorial Hospital, as well as director of trauma at the Morehouse School of Medicine. Dr. Danner also serves as chair of Healthcare 2.0 and the COVID-19 Pandemic Action Group for the 100 Black Men of America. Currently, Dr. Danner is the president and CEO of Dan Bar for Life, a bariatric surgery, healthy lifestyle change, and weight management support service. Good to have you today, Dr. Danner. Mm -hmm. And also joining our panel today is Mr. Maurice Mo Evans. Mr. Evans is an 11-year veteran of the NBA and the Federation of International Basketball Association. He is also a former Federation of International Basketball Association champion, MVP, two-time All-Star, and nine-time playoff participant. His teams include the LA Lakers, Orlando Magic, Atlanta Hawks, and Detroit Pistons. During his NBA tenure, Mr. Evans also served four years as the executive vice president for the NBA Players Association. Currently, he is the founder and CEO of ELOS Sports Group, a global sports talent agency. A seasoned and accomplished thought leader, Mr. Evans is passionate about making a difference within his family, businesses, and community. He resides in Houston, Texas, where he's a proud husband and father of four. Welcome, Mr. Evans. Thank you. 
So thank you all for being here today, Dr. Coyne Beasley, Dr. Danner, and Mr. Evans. At this time, let's begin with if each of you would take a minute and just tell us about your recent experience working with COVID-19 preparedness. Dr. Coyne Beasley, would you like to begin? Well, thank you. Good afternoon. And I'm so excited to be able to participate in this wonderful program that actually recognizes that Black health matters. As a former member of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices and a vaccine researcher, I have actually served as a member of the external advisory scientific boards for a variety of COVID-19 vaccines. And as a clinician, I've had the privilege of serving as a vaccinator, not only in my clinic, but also in vaccine sites in the community, the Black community specifically. As an adolescent health specialist, health specialist and past president of the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine, I have been focused also on the development of programs and policies to really make sure that we can increase vaccination among adolescents. And I was recently funded by the National Foundation of Infectious Diseases to work with adolescents of color to develop COVID-19 vaccine messages and campaigns for their peers and for their communities. And finally, I work with NFID, which is the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases, to educate the public and healthcare professionals about infectious diseases like COVID. So thank you again for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Coyne Beasley. Uh, Mr. Evans, would you like to share your thoughts? Yes, I echo the same, you know, sentiments as Dr. Coyne Beasley. You know, we've been very active. We're excited that, you know, Black Health Matters is, is something that's very prominent and, and taking a uh, uh, huge steps to uh, to help educate our our, our um, you know our society and our, our our culture our community. What we've done here in the, uh, presently is we partnered with Sylvester Mayor Turner, the the mayor of Houston, um, to vaccinate um, individuals in underserved communities. We partnered with Esther's Cajun Cafe and Soul Food through our NBA Retired Players Association, where I now serve as a president. Very successful in, in administering uh, multiple vaccinations and helping people to to you know, educate them and also to feel better about re-assimilating uh, back into society with this new normal. Great, thank you, Mr. Evans. And Dr. Danner, your thoughts? Uh, again, I wanna echo the sentiments of Dr. Quinn Beasley and uh, Mr. Evans that appreciate what Black Health Matters doing and what the Brothers of Kappa Alpha Psi are doing over the last year. I've worked with the 100 Black Men of America and the Health and Wellness Committee and we've done virtual town halls to educate people on COVID as well as chronic diseases such as diabetes and hypertension and obesity and how they interact or intersect to cause the increased disparities that we're seeing in African-American and underrepresented communities. In addition, you know, we work with local organizations to do community service screening and education to support because as not only a critical care specialist, as a surgeon, one of the big things is, like Dr. Quinn Beasley, I can't operate on COVID-19. So providing a lot of educational support and working with different organizations to provide strategies on how to address it from a global and a regional and then a local level. So uh, we also, I'm also a published author and kind of written and studied about vitamin D and its metabolism and how, you know, kind of looking at it from not only a critical care, but a health and wellness standpoint, immune optimization. My undergrad background is in microbiology. And so just trying to bring all those things together to help us navigate the pandemic is what I spent the past year and a half actually helping us attempt. Uh, it's a big fight. We're still in the battle. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for all of you for being our panelists today. We asked you to come together to shed some light on how we can all safely return to some sense of normalcy this summer, now that a good number of people here in the US have been vaccinated. So let's start with you, Dr. Danner. Can you share with us an update on how COVID-19 immunizations in the US are progressing, provide an update on the vaccine rollout and discuss hesitancy regarding the black community? I will. Uh, can I have the first slide, please? And so, you know, again, this uh, past year has really been really challenging for the African American community as well as, you know, America in general due to COVID and, you know, in the world. 
So, um, you know, I want to thank the Brothers of Kappa Alpha Psi for recognizing that and not looking back on it, but looking at the path going forward uh, as we deal with this COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. So in December of 2020, December 10th, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices met uh, with the FDA and they uh, were able to approve the rollout of the vaccines, as we know, first with Pfizer and then with Moderna and subsequently with Johnson & Johnson. Since that time, uh, recommendations have been made that all adults and all children over 12 get vaccinated. Next slide. So what I'd like to do is again, in this short time, just kind of educate you on the different vaccine options. I know there's a lot of confusion out there still, uh, a lot of science involved, but there are basically three platforms for vaccines. Most of them are, are all of them are centered around what's called the spike protein, which is a, uh, a protein that fits into the angiotensin II receptor in the human body. Uh, so the two uh, that are by Moderna and Pfizer are mRNA copies. These are transcripts that are read by the body to make a protein. And then there are DNA vaccines that recombinant come viral vector proteins by AstraZeneca and Janssen that are uh, basically on adenoviral vector, which means you put the molecule on top of the viral vector adenovirus, which is actually a common cold virus. And then you give it to it to give a delivery mechanism similar to a real virus. And then the other uh, type of vaccine model is a protein subunit in which you actually make the actual protein which serves as an antigen. And so the Novavax and the vaccine by Sanofi are protein subunits of the spike protein or angiotensin uh, moiety. And then it's delivered and the body makes antibodies against it to help build its immunity. Next slide. So over the course of this uh, last probably six, seven months since the rollout, there's now been at least 184,000 people or 56% of the population that have received at least one dose. Over 159,000 or 49% of the population have been fully vaccinated. This is as of uh, July 11th, according to uh, data from the CDC. Next slide. And so when we look at this, you know, pandemic, just even over the last month, looking at some trends, uh, last month this time we had done uh, another presentation uh, with Black Health Matters. And at that time there were 173 million cases of COVID worldwide with 3.74 million deaths. Since that time, next slide, we increased from 173 million to 187 million and now crossed over 4 million deaths. This is just to say that we're still in the midst of the pandemic and you know we're still having people who are infected and dying. So in the United States, next slide, we've now crossed over 600,000 deaths and 33.7 million people infected. India is rapidly rising and now it's crossed over 30 million and they've become the second most prominent country in the world as it relates to deaths related to coronavirus and surpassed Brazil and the other westernized countries. Next slide. And so when we look at the people who are fully vaccinated, you look at the lighter areas versus the darker areas you see most people are kind of in this more teal area now where half the country has actually been vaccinated and we're actually getting better than we were in the early days. And so in some of the curves, you'll see that maybe Dr. Quentin Beasley is gonna talk about, will show some of the patterns uh, as um, the numbers are going down in response to all the efforts that are being made, but variants are coming up. And so that's another conversation. Next slide. However, within the African-American and Native American uh, populations, but particularly African-Americans, there's still a lot of vaccine hesitancy uh, for COVID-19. And that's what we wanna talk about a little bit because you know, as people are kind of helping to navigate this pandemic, it's gonna to have to be a participatory sport. 
we have to work together to see how to get out of this. But in this slide, we notice that in the darker areas, even in the kind of Northwest, you see there's more hesitancy, but in the lighter areas, in the populated areas like the inner cities, people have been more willing to take it because they're congregated together. Uh, so there's a lot of variability that still exists. And so in order to close this hesitancy, there's going to have to be a lot of education, a lot of conversation with at churches, at schools, at the workplace, and forums like this. So we want to thank Black Health Matters and Cap Alpha Psi again for addressing this important issue. Next slide. And so when we look at COVID-19 vaccine data based on race and ethnicity, we notice that in the bottom tier, uh, this is Caucasians, and right above it is African-American, then Hispanics. And if you look at people who have been uh, initi who initiated vaccination in the last 14 days, you know, the Black population is staying pretty consistent at about 10%, but the Hispanic population has increased. There's been a slight decrease in the Caucasian population, but overall the white population actually has about 61% of the people vaccinated. African-Americans are still laughing, lagging behind at 12% and Hispanics at 17%. Next slide. So when we look at these patterns uh, over time, we see that there is a slight increase in all populations, but if you look at black and Hispanic versus white and Asian, they are basically 33%, 39% versus approaching 50 to 60%. Now, if you notice over the last probably three months or two months since uh, late May till now, the numbers are starting to flatten out. So we still have work to go to achieve what President Biden is seeking, 80% uh, vaccination to achieve what we would call herd immunity. Next slide. So what are the recommendations to reduce COVID as we look to getting back into society? I think the number one thing is to get educated on your options, know that there are different vaccines out there. They're still doing research to figure out what the best vaccine and approach is. Uh, so read, uh, pay attention and stay informed. But what can you do on a personal level? Keep your body as optimal as possible. Get moderate to vigorous exercise, You know, 30 to 60 minutes three to five times a week. And so that's 90 to 180 minutes, uh, so 30 to 60 minutes a day, three to five times a week at least. And eat a healthy balanced diet. Uh, try to do this on a daily basis. You know, if you're not able to eat healthy, you can try nutritional supplementation. No one magic pill exists. So taking multivitamins, taking vitamin D, making sure your vitamin D level is normal. Over 30 is a good number. Over 40 is probably better. Ask your doctor taking zinc supplementation, particularly if you have a common cold or upper respiratory tract virus like codies and some of these other things, we take it just because it slows viral replication. So taking this, particularly if you have an infection, may help to optimize your immune health. But as practitioners, the first thing, primary prevention, wearing your mask, practicing social distancing and, and you know, good hand hygiene, optimize your immune system, and then all these other things are important. It's important to realize that the virus is mutating. There are different strains, alpha. There's now the Delta strain that's increased to the most prevalent one in America. It may or may not basically be able to harm you if you get sick if you are vaccinated, but you can actually still spread it. So you have to think about other people, protecting your family, your loved ones, and the community. So until we get out of this pandemic, I think safe and sorry, continue to wear your mask and if you're around unfamiliar people, use prudence and get vaccinated and continue to practice safety first. Next slide. So what, can, what are some key points in order to halt this? So in order to halt this COVID-19 pandemic, everyone has to participate and must be a part of the process. The risk of severe COVID-19 and premature death must may be much higher and likely due to this Delta variant of the coronavirus. So, you know, receiving your vaccine, especially those with weaker immune systems and pre-existing chronic disease is very important. 
while the data provides useful insight, there's there also remain gaps, limitations, inconsistencies that limit our ability to get a clear and complete picture of who is and who's not getting vaccinated and who remains at risk due to COVID-19. So this isn't the time to drop your guard because African Americans and Hispanics continue to be at higher risk of COVID-19 related disability and death, but still lag in getting vaccinated. And so just understand we are, you know, putting ourselves in positions where we don't use kind of practical judgment and just understand also that there are, you know, you have to make your own decisions. So be informed. Next slide. If you have uh, questions, and then we'll be able to entertain this and put them in the chat and uh, we'll be able to address this. Uh, next slide. And so again, I just want to thank you, the audience, for listening. I want to thank my uh, co panelists and I want to thank uh, Black Health Matters. So, uh, Ms. Erlen, I, I want to thank you for the opportunity just to share some information. Thank you, Dr. Danner, for those recommendations. Uh, Dr. Quinn Beasley. Are there any concerns regarding the new COVID-19 variants and the effectiveness of the current vaccines against the variants? Okay, it looks like I was having some difficulty with my audio, which is you know, one of the things we always worry about when we have these kinds of presentations. But thank you so much for asking that question. It's an incredibly important question. And in fact, if we go to the first slide, we can add COVID to the virus that causes COVID-19. COVID-19, like many other viruses, can constantly mutate. So variants to this virus can occur, and it really wasn't a complete surprise. As already um, talked about in the outstanding presentation that was just done, multiple variants of COVID-19 have been documented not only in the United States, but also globally, including those that are listed here. And again, we should proceed to the next slide. Um, that are listed on this slide. They are listed by their scientific numeric designation, followed by the Greek nomenclature, and then the location where it was first identified. So we have alpha. The alpha, and, and can we get to the next slide actually? It's on the next slide. Okay, great, thank you. So the alpha, it was first identified um, in in the UK, followed by the beta, which was first identified in South Africa, followed by the gamma that you already heard about in Brazil. And then the last one you've heard about, which is the delta, followed, found mostly initially uh, in India. All of these viruses and variants are actually of concern for a variety of reasons. One, because they actually have higher transmissibility meaning that they can be transmitted between one another a little bit more frequently uh, and, and, and quickly. Again, it also has some increased disease severity such that it's more likely to result in hospitalizations and in some people even death. Now, scientists are monitoring changes in the virus and these variants and variants and information about these variants are rapidly emerging. And I just wanna highlight that because it's not misinformation that people hear. It's oftentimes new information as we learn more about the disease and we learn more about the variants. It's important to know that existing vaccines are expected to be um, effective against the current Delta variant and the other variants that are currently here, um, and at least particularly for the short term. So getting vaccinated is incredibly important even when we think about the protection against variants. Next slide, please. Okay, the next slide actually tells us that not only, um, I wanna focus on the Delta variant and I wanna focus on that because that's the variant we've been hearing the most about lately and it's rightly so because not only is it found in all 50 states in the United States, it's also the variant that's most uh, prevalent now. It's occurring in 51.7% of all new infections in the United States. And because of this variant, 
Most areas of our country are seeing a new surge in COVID-19 cases as a variant of these, this virus should be an important reminder to us that the pandemic is not over despite easing and some of our restrictions. So the most prominent variant and strain that's in the US in many places like Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, and Nebraska, it represents more than 80% of new infections. And as I've mentioned before, it spreads more easily and quickly, and that's why it's leading to more cases. Who is at risk for these variants as well as other just normal COVID-19? It poses the most significant risk and threat to people who are unvaccinated. And I wanna talk about a, a common COVID-19 myth that I just wanna emphasize. And that myth is that current COVID-19 vaccines will not protect against mutations of COVID-19. This is not true. The fact is that while viruses generally mutate over time, as I mentioned, the data suggests that the current COVID-19 vaccines available in the United States will be effective against the emerging variants of the virus. And it will continue to be monitored through surveillance uh, to determine if it becomes ineffective. One of the things that Dr. Fauci actually reminds us of is that there was never a reason to get vaccinated uh, other than you know, protection against variants. And variants is one of the reasons to get protected, as well as protecting yourself, your family, and your community. Next slide, please. I wanna emphasize again, it is those who remain unvaccinated that are at greatest risk. And this, as Dr. Danner already mentioned, is of tremendous importance to our community. When we look at this bar graph here, it shows the percent of individuals 12 years of age and older who are fully vaccinated by race and ethnicity. Being fully vaccinated means receiving two doses of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine or one dose of the Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine. Only 15% of Latinos, 6% of Asians, and approximately 9% of Black individuals are fully vaccinated compared with 60% of whites. Individuals 12 years of age or older who classify themselves as multiple races or others also have low vaccination proportions with only about 8% fully vaccinated. Next slide, please. You actually saw this slide um, by Dr. Danner. It's actually a figure that demonstrates not necessarily fully vaccinated, some of them are, but individuals who have received at least one COVID-19 vaccine by race and ethnicity. As already discussed and described, Black and Latinos have the whites. So when we look at this particular graph, we see that less than 35% of Blacks have received at least one COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide, please. There are also regional variations in the doses administered that you can see on this slide. The lowest rates are indicated by the light green color and they're most prominent in southeastern regions, in states like South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, Tennessee, Missouri. What might these states also have in common? If you can take me to my next slide, please. On the next slide, you, may, you can see why, where the low vaccination rates are important and significant. When you look at the percentage of African Americans by state, you will note that the majority of states with the lowest total vaccination doses administered also align with some of the states where you have the greatest proportion of African Americans where they reside, such as South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Now, why might it be important and why do I emphasize that? It is these states where you have low vaccination rates that actually have the greatest vulnerability of spikes in COVID disease, illness, hospitalizations, and even deaths. And they align with places where large proportions of our populations live. Next slide, please. 
So what can we encourage our communities to do and what should you do? Some of this has already been mentioned by Dr. Dana, but it's very important that those of you who are on this call, um, that you work together with your community to help provide the correct information and encourage and even assist everyone to get vaccinated as soon as possible. And that may even mean driving your friends and neighbors to vaccine sites. It is also important that we make sure that our children, adolescents, adults, and elders are up to date on all other recommended vaccines that they have, may have missed during the COVID pandemic. This is important because vaccines can prevent us from deadly diseases that often also disproportionately impact our community, such as cervical cancer. And we all know that COVID-19 has had a disproportionate impact on the Black community. So it's important for us to keep up our rates on routine recommendations. Next slide. Some other things that you can do, and I'm saying it again for emphasis, get vaccinated as soon as you can. But you also need to continue other public health strategies that are recommended, such as wearing a mask, washing your hands, continue social distancing. And can I say it one more time? Get vaccinated as soon as you can. We all can be COVID-19 heroes. We can all stop the spread of COVID-19 that is devastating our community. And we all need to get vaccinated to give ourselves the best opportunity to decrease the disproportionate illness in our community, as well as getting back to some of the normal activities that we used to do. So I thank you so much for your attention and time. Thank you so much, Dr. Coyne Beasley for that update on the COVID-19 variant and the importance of why we need to make sure that we get vaccinated. And so Mr. Evans, as we're talking about the vaccines, vaccine hesitancy and the idea of vaccine choice as people are getting back out there and re-engaging on a social level, I understand you and your family had a pretty tough experience with COVID-19. Was this before or after the vaccines were available? And can you tell us a little bit more about what you and your family experienced? Sure. First and foremost, I want to definitely thank Dr. Danner and Dr. Coyne Beasley for that, those very, uh, you know, informative uh, presentations. I think that's one of the challenges that we're all facing right now, just the, the lack of information. And as, and as Dr. Coyne Beasley mentioned, new information. I learned, I learned a lot just in that presentation. So thank you for that. And just to answer your question, Ms. Erlen, you know, for us, we did experience uh, many challenges here. I'm, I live in the state of Texas, as you spoke of in Houston. Uh, unfortunately for us, you know, our, our children uh, started school back in, in August. So in the midst of still um, a lot of, um, you know, just uncertainty, we didn't know how to restart. There wasn't, um, you know, a lot of great plans around the country rolling out. Obviously, we knew that all of the, the impacts of what went down with the, the, the presidential election and, and the different uh, challenges we face as a country about vaccination to get vaccinated or not to get vaccinated. And so for us, you know, our, our children started school um, in August and, and they were doing virtual learning. But in September, uh, Texas decided that they were going to uh, open the option for in-person uh, learning. And unfortunately, we didn't we didn't have the option there at the school. So our children, we have, you mentioned that we have four. Um, at the time, we did have four children. And we found out during that time that my wife uh, was expecting. So our children are, are all first grade, second grade, third grade, and uh, fifth grade at the time. And, uh, you know, and one of the protocols for the school is that, you know, they follow social distancing, wear a mask, wash your hands, uh, you know, set six feet apart, all the, you know, no sharing school supplies, no visitors, things of that nature. Unfortunately, on a number of occasions, we would receive emails from the school saying that our children had been exposed to someone who had tested positive for COVID-19 and or may have come in contact with. So at that time, every time that happened, we had to take our children to, um, you know, to get tested and, and prove a negative test before they could return to school. If not, the kids were unable to come to school in, for 14 days and still had to prove a negative test. And so around uh, January of 23rd, you know, of 2021, we were blessed to welcome in our new uh, infant daughter, our fifth child, um, you know, and, and, and so when we did that, I unfortunately was at the hospital, happened to just be uh, going down to get food for my, my, my wife. And, uh, and they said, hey, we got these extra vaccinations 
And uh, and so I ended up taking the Pfizer shot right then on the spot, but it was only serendipitous that I was able to, to receive that um, vaccination in January. So fast forward to March, right before spring break, we were told that again, one of our children had been exposed to, um, to someone who may have had uh, contracted COVID-19. So just like the other tests, we um, assumingly went to the urgent care, I went and got everybody uh, tested, my wife, my infant child, and my uh, four children. And unfortunately, um, at that time, we were informed that my wife tested positive uh, for COVID-19. My infant child, who was only you know less than uh, you know two months old at the time, tested positive for COVID-19. And my son tested positive for COVID-19. So now we were so conflicted in that you know still a lot of uncertainty. We didn't know how we were all going to respond. But in addition to having an infant child now test positive, the other children, you know, our other daughters, three daughters and myself, we tested negative. And then we live, my, my mother and father, who are elderly, they're both 66 and 65, you know, or li live with us in our home. And they have underlying health conditions. So when you have this mixture and this combination of things going on, we, we were really um, at a conundrum as to how to... Uh, to best handle this this scenario, so we ended up, you know, going in uh, quarantining in a hotel, and it just we were fortunate in that 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 break for our children. But um, you know, God, you know, thanks be to God that uh, you know, no one in, um, exhibited any uh, symptoms that allowed us to be hospitalized or any of the different things. We quarantined there. My wife unfortunately lost her uh, taste and smell, but other than that, you know, we uh, fully recovered. Um, you know, after the the 14 day wait period, went back and tested a uh, negative for COVID-19. And during that time, you know, since then, we've uh, partnered with Mayor Turner here in the city of Houston. And my wife and has been vaccinated. My mother-in-law, my parents, my sister, we've gotten uh, family members vaccinated. We uh, partnered with Mayor Turner to uh, launch a campaign called Take Your Best Shot. So we leveraged some of our NBA and, and our, our sports background to try to come up with a catchy, uh, you know, a uh, campaign slogan that would allow us to, uh, you know, a use our credibility and and we partner with um, Steve Francis, the, the Houston Rocket, uh, known as TV franchise. He's really great uh, individual and he's put his credibility on the line as well. And we've been very successful uh, helping educate and, and get people to get fascinated in, in, in the community. And so, you know, again, I want to thank Black Health Matters for Black Lives Matters and Black Health Matters for just what you guys are doing. And uh, I want to thank the Kappa Alpha Psi for having us, you know, here and be a part of this uh, opportunity. And of course, um, again, uh, my former, my, my panelists, uh, Dr. Danner and, and Dr. Coyne Beasley for, for again, sharing all the information and, and, and experience that you all have. Thank you so much for sharing your story. You know, as we listen to it, um, the many, there's so many other COVID-19 stories out there in our community. And we know soon that our kids will be returning to the classroom as early as next month in some areas of the country. And many of us have already begun to return to work. There are a lot of people in the black community that are still concerned about getting the vaccine. The fact that vaccines are not yet approved for kids 12 and under, and then additional concerns regarding the new variants. So panel, now let's think about what your thoughts and recommendations are about what will the new normal post COVID look like in the work environment and what precautions should we personally take? Uh, Dr. Danner, let's start with you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Erwin, thank you for that question. And I agree, I receive a lot of those uh, communications re regarding everyone's concerns. And I, I think that, you know, the first thing is we have to address them as real and, you know, it's fair because people, you know, everybody has their own individual thoughts and opinions. And that's why we stress getting more edu education, more information. And I, th I think, you know, it's important that whether it's a school, whether it's a business, that you have strategies in place. I think throughout the pandemic, if we're realistic, there are going to be people, camps that actually take the vaccine and those that do not. We have to address for our real reality and be able to work with them and not put anybody at risk as we navigate and try to get through the pandemic. We have to keep the main thing, the main thing. And the main thing is getting through this pandemic. We need to shut the pandemic down. And how do we do that? 
we're trying to figure it out, but it's going to take us working together. I think from an individual standpoint, I think it's very important that we maintain safety protocols, as Dr. Coyne Beasley said, that from a public health perspective, we know what the CDC has come out and said, but we also know that there's risk to doing that. There's still science. We're learning every day. A lot of people think that we have all the answers. I'll just be frank and honest, we don't. So we have to learn together as doctors and scientists and as members of the community, we have to understand that we're in the same boat together and people are doing the best we can. We understand there's no 100% guarantee on any recommendation coming from us or from Dr. Fauci or any other figure, but what we're trying to do is give the best of medical, the medical science for you to make your own individual decisions. Some people have asked even about herbalists and natural approaches to things versus conventional medicine. Just understand, we don't know. We do know a healthy body is gonna fight off disease, cancer, high blood pressure, or a virus or bacteria than a weaker body. So doing things to take care of your temple is very key practicing good practical common sense things. If you're in an environment that's closed, a bunch of strangers, protect yourself. If you're out in an open environment, you know, it's hard to get a virus when you're out in the sun and doing things with your family and friends. So keep your circles tight. Don't venture out too far and don't basically drop your guard, throw your hands up and do the wave. We are actually still down by three touchdowns and it's the fourth quarter. <laughs> Definitely a lot of protection we need to move forward with to prevent from uh, getting the COVID-19 virus. And how about in terms of measures regarding our businesses? What should they be putting in place to help workers be as safe as possible, knowing that they're going to come in contact, pretty close contact, with so many people every day? Dr. Danner, would you like to address mm -hmm. the uh, business perspective? Yeah, I, I would. And I think that the, the biggest thing for businesses, I would recommend having protocols in place. This should not be a surprise. You shouldn't come to work and, okay, what are we going to do? These things should be written. There should be policies laid out. And I don't mean a policy that mandates that I get vaccinated, you get vaccinated, but, you know, those are considerations that you have to make. You should have some kind of testing available so people, if they do have concerns, that you should be carrying out periodic surveillance. You should make sure that you still have alcohol-based uh, hand sanitizer available. And depending on your environment, it may not be time to congregate everybody back. Most environments are kind of half staffed so that you don't have rooms that have more than two or three people in if they're not spacious and well ventilated. Make sure that you have adequate ventilation if possible. Air circulating seems to decrease the ability to spread infections inside of uh, closed environments. And then the last thing I think is that you should have some kind of screening. A lot of people are checking temperatures as a way to screen. Another way to check and see if somebody's having something concerning is a pulse oximeter that measures your oxygen saturation. We haven't done it throughout the pandemic, but oxygen dropping and temperatures kind of going up or down are actually two of the main objective measures. As Mo said, some people are losing, you know, their taste and smell. Some people are developing diarrhea. So everybody isn't developing respiratory symptoms. So there should be some kind of screen that says, hey, this person needs to be looked at a little more carefully versus, you know, I'm fine. Every day when we go to work, we fill out a survey. Are we having any of these symptoms? So we can determine if we need to basically call in and say that we're having symptoms, we need to go get tested. But you should have a set place where people can get tested at will. Uh, I think that there has to be privacy and confidentiality maintained. And my own personal uh, just thought, you know, optimizing your immune health to follow up with your doctor, you know, again, with taking a simple multivitamin and things like zinc, turmeric, all those kind of things, they do work. But just understand, uh, and I want to address this particularly from the standpoint of historical perspectives, things like, you know, uh, some of the experiments, some of the complications happen with medication. Anytime you have a new medication, there are risks and complications with any medication, and we learn about that over time. So this is what happens anytime you develop something new, 
and we have to continue to learn and understand and adjust from there. This is a process in evolution and not something that's final right now. We're still evolving, we're still learning. There are new vaccines that are gonna come out that haven't come online as we're learning. So again, we're fighting through this together. Employers have to be involved. They have to talk to the employees and they should actually have conversations that are open and let them know what their positions are and listen to their concerns. That's what my recommendations would be. Thank you, Dr. Danner. And Dr. Coinbeasley, how about the school environment? What precautions should the schools be taking at this time to keep our kids safe? And what can we do as parents? Thank you so much for asking that question. And, and it'll include a lot of the responses um, from Dr. Danner, some of those excellent tips that he provided. I think the, the main important takeaway from the advice that the CDC came with out from you know, last week, actually it was on Friday, is that we now know that students really benefit better from in-person learning rather than virtual learning. And so that's safely returning to in-person instruction is actually a, a huge priority. When we think about what's going to lead that priority or what's the most important leading public health strategy, it really is vaccination. So promoting vaccination is the number one way in which we can help people return to school safely and also return to in-person learning not only in-person learning, but all those other things at school that also young people like, such as their extracurricular activities or sports. We do know, however, that not everybody who goes to school is 12 years of age or older. So individuals who are less than 12 or anyone who is not fully vaccinated, the CDC recommends consistent and correct mask usage. And this is particularly important, not only when they're indoors, but when those individuals are in crowded uh, settings, particularly when physical distancing cannot be maintained. One of the changes that they did make to the recommendations, however, is that for people who are fully vaccinated in schools, they do not need to wear masks, particularly when they can maintain at least three feet of physical distance between students and classrooms. So, and when of course in those same classrooms, people who aren't vaccinated are actually wearing masks or not fully vaccinated to reduce transmission risk. However, the CDC felt it was so important to actually get back people back into schools that they recommended to not cause any disparities in school districts that couldn't get people in school or may not have opportunities for virtual learning. They also offered a layered approach. So you might say, what are, what's a layered approach? And those are some of the things Dr. Danner mentioned. So if you're not able to maintain three feet of distance, then do screening testing. In etiquette such as covering your mouth when you sneeze and then staying home when you get sick and if you get sick get tested and that's not only for the kids getting tested is also important for the adults in the school and then contact tracing with quarantine as you heard um, presented by uh, my colleague Mo and isolation and then cleaning with disinfectant so again, teachers, staff, and students should stay home if they get sick. People who are not uh, vaccinated, they can do that layered approach we talked about in terms of the school district determining you know, where they wanted to in implement other solutions. And then what's really important because the CDC recognized is that different communities are different, that localities and public health professionals at the local level should monitor community transmission as well as vaccine coverage and, and uh, get screening tests. So when you ask what can you do as a parent, there are a number of things. Make sure that your kid stays home if they're sick. If they're less than 12 years of age, make sure that they actually wear a mask and that they know how to wear it carefully and appropriately, meaning that it covers the mouth and nose, and also make sure that they get to school safely and that you know what your school's policies are so that you can try to be as adherent to those policies as possible for your family.
Thank you, Dr. Coyne Beasley, for those recommendations as our kids return to school. And lastly, Mr. Evans, what preparations and plans are your family taking as back to school approaches? Sure, thank you for the question. And again, thank you for the insights. Uh, I don't wanna, um, you know, be so redundant because again, Dr. Dan and Dr. Coyne Beasley have been so eloquently, um, you know, stating again, all of the different measures and basically being proactive and taking preventative uh, measures for us. I think one of the things that we are mindful of is not underestimating um, this virus, just because we were blessed and fortunate to have uh, survived during our, our encounter that we had with uh, COVID-19 back in, uh, in March, we are definitely not underestimating you know this this is this virus at all because there's been a lot of people who haven't been quite as as blessed and as fortunate as, as we have been and i would recommend that to other people is to not uh relax your guard as, as dr dan and dr coin beasley has said this this virus and different variants are, are very active out there so as we've done is we've, we've been very mindful to, uh, to to get vaccinated we've also um you know again obviously i'm a, a former nba player my son played baseball for the first time this year. He's got out there, you know, outdoors and, and he really loved it. And we're trying to uh, be mindful to, to stay active and continue to, um, you know, to, to, to live life and try to enjoy it as best as we can, but just to be a little bit more mindful in the decisions that we make. And, and those are things that I would recommend to others as well. Thank you so much for your insights there. You know, this past year has impacted us all a lot, including neglecting our usual self-care routines, such as medical appointments to manage our physical and mental well-being. Why is getting back to these regular medical appointments so important now coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic? Let's start with you, Dr. Coyne Beasley. Yeah, I really, really appreciate that question. And I appreciate it, particularly when we're talking about adolescents or our young people. Um, one of the things that's important is that vaccines often allow us the entree to go into the clinic to actually get the routine care that we need. So in addition to getting the COVID vaccine, you can also get the other vaccines that we mentioned like HPV or Tdap and a variety of others. But one of the things that we do with adolescents and young people is we actually do do mental health screening. So we screen for depression and anxiety. But we also know that in the black community, we also have even our young people who may have chronic disease. We can check your blood pressure. We can check your eyes. So getting in allows us to take care of your total health, but even your psychosocial health. Help. And what we know, particularly for young people who haven't had the opportunity to socialize and be in school, that depression and anxiety was a real thing for them. And so getting them in, and I want you to know that they are treatable. They are things that we can do to help manage uh, people's anxiety and depression, as well as their blood pressure and other chronic diseases they may have. So getting them in for vaccination is important because then we can look at their entire physical and mental health profile to make sure that they're doing okay. Thank you, Dr. Coyne Beasley. And Dr. Danner, what are your thoughts on reclaiming your health as we move forward? You know, I, I think two things. I think that one, what we do in the doctor's office, you know, is very important as far as giving guidance and treating things acutely. What you do outside the doctor's office is what really matters as it relates to your long-term chronic health condition. So it's important to take the advice that your physicians are giving you. It's important to take care of yourself and be active and do the right things before and after those doctor visits. And it's a balance. But one of the biggest things that happened throughout the pandemic was a breakdown in communication. A lot of the advice we can give can be done remotely. But what we've learned is through digital technology, through re remote patient management, we're now able to actually convey a lot of information to do a lot of things differently than we did traditionally. So there's going to be a new health care system. It's going to be called a healthcare 2.0. We talk about that 100 Black Men of America initiative, but we, there's going to be a reset button. And so, you know, there's, you know, people talk about a great reset. Some of it's good, some of it may be bad, but we won't go back to the way it was. And so I think that, again, what you have to understand is the doctors, the, the nurse practitioners, the PAs, medical environment has been highly educated to help you understand your health. This should be a doctor-patient partnership, and not just a relationship. It's not Dr. Coyne Beasley's responsibility to do those things for you, but it is your responsibility to engage with her, engage with your primary care physician, learn what you need 
to take care of whatever it is you're dealing with, whether it's high blood pressure, whether it's diabetes, whether, you know, that 20 or 30 pounds of weight that people have gained, it's time to shed the pounds. It's time to get focused, get back out, get active, but really have a specific goal in mind. Don't just get out just doing anything randomly. You know, have a target and then work toward that target. When you achieve that, set you a new target. This is an ongoing effort. Being healthy should be a lifetime endeavor and not just some acute act. So you should actually engage in, you know, good healthy practices in general. We all know that, but we don't necessarily do it. So I do totally understand and get it. But one thing, Linda, if I may, kind of just to address some of the questions, somebody asked a question in the chat about, you know, people getting infected after being vaccinated. And, you know, that's a real concern. When you have a virus, virus's natural tendency is to mutate. So you can mutate means you can't go around things. And with the particular the initial vaccine, the mRNA vaccines, they actually slow down the ability of people getting sick and getting hospitalizations. They may or may not help a person from getting infected. And that's why it's so important that people understand that they can get infected with the variant and not get sick and give it to someone else that places them at risk. That's why we can't drop our guards and understand that we will learn more later, but we have to monitor data now. So this is not the time to basically stop communicating. It's important that we talk to each other. It's important that whether it's in the church or in the community, people are getting information to consult and allay their fears and concerns. And so I think that again, as we're going back to this, what you do between the doctor's visit, practicing safe practices, Dr. Coyne Beasley said, Eating a healthy balanced diet, that means eating vegetables, eating so much fruit, taking, you know, vitamin, not so much meat, not so much sugary, you know, things that help us gain with that kind of comfort foods. Start to minimize them. It's okay to indulge, but overindulgence is different than indulging. So there's some common sense practical things that can be done. And that's what my recommendations are. Thank you so much, Dr. Danner, for those recommendations on how we can reclaim our health. Mr. Evans, as an athlete, obviously you focus on your health and endurance. And now as a business owner and a husband and a father, what are your thoughts and recommendations regarding the COVID-19 prevention? Yeah, I, again, I appreciate the question. For me personally, I think that, you know, we all have a responsibility, as Dr. Danner said, to, uh, to leave this, you know, just a personal responsibility, not to, to put all the information and onus on the doctors and the experts. We have a personal responsibility to gain information to, to I'm reading some of the questions in, in the chat. Don't wanna be dismissive at all to, to questions and concerns that a lot of people have. Like for me and my family, we've taken a lot of onus, especially even prior to us uh, contracting the, the, the COVID uh, virus and things of that nature to make sure that we informed decisions. When I decided to go get vaccinated, I, A, I prayed about it, I, B, I went out and researched it and decided which vaccination was best for me. I decided on the Pfizer, even though my wife and my, my uh, you know, my other family members decided on uh, the Moderna. My parents were elderly and they didn't want to take the vaccination, so guess what? They did the Johnson Johnson. So for us, one of my personal philosophies is that we all have a responsibility to leave this world better than what we found it and to steward the success that we have based off the sphere of influence that I have. So people, I'm a role model in my community. I'm also the president of the National Basketball Retired Players. That's the largest retired NBA player base in the country. So they're looking to me for guidance, for leadership, and to bring them valuable information. Hence is why I'm even a part, so blessed to be a part of this Black Health Matters panel to be able to aid gain more insights and information, but then to also go back and disseminate it and to model it. So I thank you all for, you know, allowing us to uh, to be a part of this opportunity and to share the information that you all have shared with us. Thank you, Ms. Can I, can I make a comment? I am trying to uh, read the things in the chat. I know some people are asking, are you all reading the chat? And I really do want to address the elephant in the room because if we don't talk about it, then you know we've left some things unsaid. And so I want to say one thing, and I certainly understand the concerns that people have about vaccination. 
there's a history of medical misdeeds. There are also, you know, are in the time we're asking you to do this, you know, racial injustice is prominent in our minds. But I want you to know that this vaccine has been administered to over 100 million people around the world. And if you think about all the things that we have or that we put into our body, nothing has been able to fully eradicate and get rid of disease and in the process, diminish health disparities like vaccines have. I'm old enough that I can remember getting a smallpox vaccination. That was some great information. I hope she can come back soon. Dr. Dan, do you want to maybe pick up where she left off? Yeah, no, I, 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 I will. And, you know, I think that particularly for the medical community, and I'll, I'll speak, and one of the big things is that, you know, from the standpoint of getting vaccinated, whether it's flu shot, whether it's the small box, whether it's all those other different vaccines that we've gotten, most of us are, are fully vaccinated. We have to as a condition of working. So, I don't want anybody to think that we are, by any stretch of the imagination, not cognizant of when vaccinations and two, the concerns, whether it's the Tuskegee experiment, whether it's other, like you said, medical misdeeds has happened over time. We understand those fears and concerns are real. I still think though that we have to work together. We're in the midst of a pandemic. Somebody asked about precision medicine. Call these things what we want. We have to work together in stages, just like a military assault, but now the whole world is the army and everything is a two. So the bottom line is there's no one set answer, but there's an answer that we have to operate together. We have to operate in a spirit of truth. And I think a lot of people are worried about the transparency, the misinformation, the, you know, the disinformation and the lack of understanding. So I say that education becomes important because we're learning real time. The things that we know, we know that again, if you go, there are complications related to anything, they're out there. And to address some of those, we have to look at it like this. At the end of the day, if you look at the numbers overall, the people who have died from getting the virus right now in America is 600,000. The number of people worldwide is 4 million. The number of people who have died from the vaccine is a lot less. The died from blood pressure medicine, a lot less. Diabetes medicine, a lot less. It, you can go across the board. You can always find these kind of things. So does it mean that you don't basically go into war because so many people die? You know that when you go into a war, people are going to die. And sometimes even friendly fire but you can't not fight the war. You have to go in. We have to fight this battle. This is a battle we have to win. This is our lives, our livelihood, our family's livelihoods that are on the line here. And we're trying to get through this and everybody on this panel would like to be outside of this pandemic as much as anybody else on the planet, I assure you. So again, uh, I just, I empathize with the audience. I understand your concerns. We've been having these discussions for a year and a half now and people want answers. And again, we can give you the best answer we can, but the same information is out there. You know, again, this is not for political purposes, it's for educational and empowerment purposes. And there's a difference between the two. And I think the other thing to think about with the rising cases and the variants, I think that we all are incredibly COVID fatigued, but we really do run a great risk of actually having a third wave if we don't get more of the population vaccinated. We'd like to have as many people as possible. And I think Dr. Danner actually mentioned, you know, 80% being that threshold for herd immunity. But we want to make sure that we don't go into a situation we're already starting to see cases rise again. And we also know that these cases affect us. They don't just affect how we live, whether we live or we die, but how we live. Do we, are we able to have our job if we have to go down into a close, close a lockdown situation again? Are we able to get our kids educated? We wanna make sure that we have all opportunities to live and to live to the fullest extent possible. And so it's, vaccinations are an incredibly 
important part of that solution. No, they're not perfect. And again, I was talking about myocarditis and pericarditis before I got cut off. Know that in fact, multi-system inflammatory disease in children is actually a real uh, significant cause of myocarditis and pericarditis that's much more significant than what they've seen in people who got vaccinated. And what you need to know is like very, each aspect of COVID that affects people of color, multi-systemic multi inflammatory disease in children has a greater preponderance in children of color. So we wanna do this because it's the right thing to do. We wanna do this to protect ourselves. We wanna do this to protect our communities and in particular, our communities of color who are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And, and I wanted to piggyback up on that because you know, one of the things, and this is, I think, the concern uh, that a lot of people have, and I'm going to speak more from just microbiology, immunology, to kind of just understand and dissect the vaccines a little bit. And I, because I think personally, if I were making a recommendation to the vaccine industry, I think that making a vaccine ultimately out of the coronavirus, the way we would do it, just like with smallpox and chickenpox and you know, polio and measles would be something that we ought to ultimately get there. So I'm not sure if we're quite there with this vaccine. If you read it carefully, they admit we're still in a trial and moving to full FDA approval without having all the information, it violates too many of our codes to actually be able to do. So that probably will not happen because the data isn't there yet. And even the quote, next shot with Pfizer, there was a CDC, FDA, HHS, like letter that basically said, no, not right now, this is too early. We don't have that kind of data. So, you know, a lot of people think the government is just pushing this with willy nilly. They aren't. With the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, there were seven people out of a million who typically got this complication. With the vaccine, it went to 20 out of a million uh, with this thrombosis, this thrombotic like phenomenon because it stimulates what's called platelet factor four. Some people, there were women who were actually on hormones that were at increased risk. So they added this as a warning, but just to be transparent, comp clots, complications like this can happen with any of these agents. And so I wanted to say for just a few seconds to address some of the concerns of a mRNA vaccine. Typically, it, the body reads that it produces a protein stimulates B cells to make antibodies against that protein, and that's called humoral immunity. The adenovirus, a viral vector protein, a virus is typically infect cells. And so those actually cells that actually address that are called T cells, your T helper cells, your cytotoxic T cells, and your natural killer cells, that's what removes infected cells. So some of the other vaccines, maybe the AstraZeneca, or Johnson & Johnson, may have a greater stimulation of T-cell immunity, which is a little longer. And so that's why right now they're recommending a full year. And then other ones, like the protein subunit ones, we are actually learning about, we don't have the information. I can speculate, but I don't have any information on that. But in general, when you have a protein subunit, the body makes antibodies against it, whether or not these cause any stimulation of any other area of the body, any other protein subunit or receptor like that platelet factor four, we don't know. So that's what we're learning right now, but just understand there are variations. And although we talk about these six that I flashed because people want this kind of information, there were over 200 and something putative vaccines. There are a lot more out there that people are experimenting on and researching because the virus, all these different receptors or knobs on there may have a different place where anybody can grab and try to eliminate or eradicate this contagion. So hopefully that helps address some of the questions from an informational standpoint, but Thank thanks. you. Thank you, Dr. Danner. And thank you, panelists. This has been so informative today. I think we've learned a great deal about COVID-19 and how to stay safe while enjoying getting out with our family, friends, and coworkers as we return to work. We also talked about how to keep our kids safe as they head back to school just a few weeks from now. And lastly, the importance of getting our health back on track. Some of the recommendations I know will be helpful, not just during the remaining summer months, but moving forward as we work our way through this pandemic. So thank you, panelists, for all of your insights this morning and the learnings that were shared. 
Again, I'm Linda Erland with GlaxoSmithKline, and we want to thank our panelists today, Dr. Tamara Coyne-Beasley, Dr. Omar Danner, and Mr. Maurice Mo Evans for giving so generously of their time and sharing their knowledge. We know how busy your schedules are. And thank you to our audience for joining us today. And a very special thanks to GlaxoSmithKline, Black Health Matters, and Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity for providing this important COVID-19 community health outreach form today. Thank you for joining us, audience, and have a safe and healthy day. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Really wonderful job, Linda. And thank you, my co-panelists. You were wonderful. I appreciate it. Thank you, panelists. This was great. And just remember, oh, yeah. prevention oh, is important. So, you know, again, do everything you can to prevent getting infected. And so be smart, be wise, and everything will work itself out. Keep your faith in God. Amen. Thank you. Get vaccinated. Amen. Amen. Okay. <laughs>